Should we just speak? Can you hear us? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll just let's speak. Well, I, I, well, can we'll move you guys, close. Can you guys hear in the back? No. We'll move close. Testing. <laughs> See, now they can hear us. Now they can hear us, yes. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, well, well, there we go. Okay, now the mics are working. Oh, now we gotta move back. I know it's Ah, technology. Go ahead. Oh, well, anyways, uh, oh no, I, I got, I got mine. Oh, okay. Well, I, right, gosh, I guess I'll just ask you to start asking questions because uh, well I, I thought I'd uh, introduce oh, us good. they don't know who we are <laughs> well, so, I guess I'll turn this over we're to world Michael famous. Floyd <laughs> I, I forget that. he's got the <laughs> sorry okay well this is uh, your name Jerry Reese Jerry and I'm, Reese. I'm Deanna Oliver I'm the toaster <laughs> so, toaster's a girl <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, thought, I was uh, telling her that I actually had one person on the crew slam the door and walk out when I said that I had hired a woman to play the lead role. Oh, wow. So those, those were the different days. Yes. <laughs> well, I thought I'd uh, have you guys just start off and kind of talk a little bit about the, the origins of this, uh, how, uh, how you came to adapt the short story of The Brave Little Toaster. Gosh, well, I had, I had already been an animator at uh, Disney Feature Animation. I had somebody had seen my work when I was in my teens. So in high school, I had gone in and mentored there before there was a Cal Arts program. Then I was teacher's assistant for the first year, where we had uh, students join me like Brad Bird and John Lasseter and John Musker, and all of us did that experiment, and it worked out pretty well. And then we went to the studio, and I animated a on a couple features there, and then I was a uh, effects supervisor on Tron, and then I left Disney to uh, explore trying to do an animated version of Will Eisner's The Spirit with Brad Bird, and Gary Kurtz was our producer. So we had big dreams, and we spent several years attempting to make that get off the ground, and then uh, it didn't seem to be getting traction at the time, and Tom Wilhite, who had been one of the producers on Tron, just called me out of the blue. So I was in the Will Eisner's The Spirit frame of mind, you know? It's like uh, pushing the envelope with something more adult and everything. So uh, he called me and said, you know, there's this book. It's called The Brave Little Toaster. And people are telling me that it would make a great short, but it needs, I, I believe that it could be a feature if it was handled the right way. So he said, uh, I don't have much money to give you, but I need somebody to develop, write, and direct an inanimate object feature. <laughs> and up to that point, there had been a lot of inanimate sort of co-stars, you know, and, uh, but all of us just went, sure, I guess, yeah, that could work. So I remember people saying, you're nuts. <laughs> um, but, you know, there were a whole group of us that just thought, you know, what the heck, it's all about characters, and as long as you, you have the characters believe in their own world, it could work. So I signed on, and, and it was insanely intense with the schedule, but we could get into some of that later if somebody has a question, so. All right. Uh, I was, I just got into the Groundlings in the main company, and I was doing just basically improvs, and someone said, they're casting a movie about a toaster. <laughs> and they, they actually, you used a lot of Groundlings, right? Yes. You, you came and saw shows, and they brought me in for the air conditioner, because at the time I kind of did a Betty Davis, which I don't even think I could do anymore. And right. I remember like, that. Yeah, it was bad, so I couldn't be the air conditioner. <laughs> but as we were talking, he said, "Would you like to audition for the toaster?" And I was so thrilled. I was, I didn't work that much at the time, and I just was like, "I can't do the lead. I can't be the toaster. The toaster's a boy." And they go, "No, you have a good toaster voice." And <laughs> I said, "Okay, you're right because you're the producers, and I'm just <laughs> an actor." And I read some of the lines, and then they said, "Can you sing?" And we're gonna, we have Van Dyke Parks, and that was because, you know, Three Dog Night. I was like, are you kidding? I get to meet Van Dyke Parks. And I said, I can sing a little. And then they cast me, and I just think Jerry Reese is a genius, and I had the best time of my life, the best role of my life. Oh, gosh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it was such a big relief to, to meet Deanna and the Groundlings, because I, I, I was madly writing pages, and we started trying to get some voice people through, and... We had some people come in that were, it was, it was a little bit more standard choices at the time. 
And, uh, Do you remember several, some of those people? I don't, and I, I don't want to mention them because of the context of, of, oh. of my conversation, which is that I was, I was extremely disappointed to hear my own words being read back to me, and I just went, oh my gosh, what movie have, am I making? It was like, I am the toaster, you know, and that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I said, oh my gosh, I know these pages are better than they sound with these voices. And Joe Ramped, who was a joy to work with, uh, had been, he was helping on story and then getting into storyboards as I started to write the script. And he said, you know, I've been doing classes at the Groundlings Improv Theater just, just to, you know, work on my acting chops and get more into characters let's just go listen to them mm -hmm. so I went and, and it was great because they're you know their shows improvisationally based you could tell them you know you're a stock of celery and this is a hot pepper and you're in love and and make it believable and they would they would they would take it on you know so they just believed their characters and brought a reality to it and then I I was happy. So. And all of us were relatively unknown and hadn't done that much voice work, and that's the genius of Jerry, is that he wanted the kind of a natural sound. So they do sound more like real characters than, you know, the big cartoon voices. So that was <laughs> that's fun. right. So, yeah, I mean, what, uh, how did you go about casting people like Tim Stark and John Lovitz and Phil Hartman and people like that? Well, gosh, they were all ground at the ground. Just ground, yeah. They were all together, so I, you know, I'd seen them on stage, I stayed through a bunch of shows, and. There they were, and, and we just sort of put out the call to them, and they came in, and and uh, you know, just they all tried different takes on it, and it was great to have their voices in my head while I continued to write because I was only part way through the script when they came in. So, you know, Lovitz was like, "Well, I could be the radio, I could be the air conditioner, I could be the, I could be the toaster, I could be the lamp, I could, you know." And he, uh, but I loved him as the radio, and so. You know, I just got each one of them in my head and customized some of the earlier writing I had done to maximize what they would bring, and then and, and then customized the rest of my writing to them, and then invited them to play as well while we were recording. Yeah, I was going to ask how how much of that was improv. The, the, the well, I'd, I'd always cover the scene as written, and then I would invite them to play beyond that, and I I used quite a bit of stuff that went beyond it. So I guess I was wondering how uh, how I I've, I've never read the book. How how far did you did you keep or, or how close did you keep to the original story? Well, I think there's only about four lines of dialogue in the book that made it into the movie. Yeah. Um, and and I remember the you know uh, in the book the there was a junkyard, but it was it was in the middle, and then other stuff happened at the end and. One of the first things when I came on the project and talked to Tom Wilhite about it was that death just seemed to me like the end. I mean, that's the graveyard for appliances, right. is, is the junkyard. So I went, that, no, that's the end of the road. That's not the middle of the road. <laughs> so we shoved it there, and then everything built towards, you know, what could the moment be to earn the brave little toaster's title of being brave, you know? So that whole thing of throwing into the gears and stuff which wasn't in the book, but it seemed like it was totally in the spirit of the book. I mean, we all love Thomas Dish's just the idea that he thought up, like, how, what would it be like to be an appliance and, and feel good when you're useful and help people and stuff? I mean, we, we got into that headspace, but from there, we just rolled with the, with the characters. So. Yeah, I, 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 I noticed that this strange motif of, of this kind of lonely aspect, like with, with the blanket kind of zooming out, when, when he noticed that the car isn't there, and, and Kirby when he's when he's left alone, and then you know, finally the toaster mm -hmm. shoving herself in there. What? How did that? How did it was? I assume that wasn't in the story. No. Well, it was. You know, it was a, about a fear of being abandoned, and wanting to be reunited with somebody that you loved that you felt you were useful for. So, and, and also there was. Um, we just had fun with aspects of their personality that seemed to fit who they were as appliances. So. Like the blanket was normally a security blanket, but it was insecure without the kid. And the lamp thought he was really bright, but he's kind of dim. And the vacuum, his task is to hold things inside. So, of course, he has a nervous breakdown. <laughs> and the toaster is warm and reflective. And like anybody that gets near sees themselves reflected in the toaster. So they see aspects of themselves and feel comfortable. So the toaster is naturally just becomes the leader. And, um, you know, the radio's just constantly on. He's the entertainer. Right. So when you put yourself in, you know, you made their functionality as appliances, 
the, just embody who they were in personalities and then figured they would only feel good about their lives if that was being used by somebody and they felt useful. Mm-hmm. You know, it was the foundation. So uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how the film got started and, and where Disney came in um, to help. Well, I think, uh, I think at the beginning, Tom Wilhite had talked to uh, John Lasseter about, about the possibility of the story. I know the two of them had discussed it roughly. Um, Tom left the studio, and he took the book rights with him. So my involvement was just meeting Tom and reading the book and taking it from there. And then Disney invested in uh, the Disney Channel rights and home video release. And so they were investors. And then there were other companies that came along, like the TDK company. I'm sure you all noticed the big TDK sign, dead center. Well, I, I did that, drawing myself, <laughs> because TDK gave us some money. And we had no money. So at the time, like Care Bears was around six or seven million. Um, Bluth films were about 12. Disney was 24, and we were two and a quarter million for all 90 minutes, so yeah. it was tough, but we, we did six months here, then uh, a staff of uh, 10 people went with me and we lived for six months in Taiwan, and so, uh, and then came back and it was six more months here, so it was a year and a half total, and uh, Disney kept the channel rights and, uh, you know, I think that's how most people discovered it, it was Disney Channel or home video after that. So. Had, it, had it played theatrically anywhere or just uh, like LA and well, New we York? Had, or? We had been at some festivals thanks to our producer and we actually, Skouris wanted to release the film um, to sort of, the, they were the art house film distributor at the time so it would be like college and young adult crowd and so they got it, they were going to do evening screenings uh, and it's like they went, well kids would like it but this is more for college and young adult and we'll go ahead and do the theatrical release and not ask for any of the video rights. But, uh, you know, the Disney Channel didn't want the competition, so they moved up the release date and stuck it on there first, so it kind of snuffed out our theatrical release, and we were very sad. But we were thrilled that people discovered it over the years in their own way, and we thought, well, you know, it's like the toaster's adventure. It's all, it's, it's rough. <laughs> Well, Deanna, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the recording sessions, because I was talking to Jerry before, and, and he had told me that you guys had a group mm-hmm. um, recording. Uh, most of my sessions, I recall, were with Lampy and Jerry, of course, and they were just, he was very clear, a great director, always made you go natural if you were too big or too small or too wrong, he'd make you bring it back to reality, which I think is great for that character. Trying to think of any good stories from a recording. I know I had to go in and do ADR. There's that one scene where she, uh, Toaster's running from the flower, and I had to go, oh, and I got paid and went home. I was like, I got paid and went home. It was as a two second job. I love that day. <laughs> That's really funny. But it's true. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. I had to go. I do. <coughs> yeah, you had and to. And you had me do sad. one more for cover. And That's then right. I got paid. Safety. And I, went home. I love that job. <laughs> loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. And well, they were just joyous and fun and great. Well, I remember there was a, a day, sometimes we had more people. We had um, Thurl Ravenscroft, who was the voice of the vacuum, was also the voice of Tony the Tiger. Tiger. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't, but, you know, I didn't know him from that. I knew him from the Haunted Mansion, from Pirates of the Caribbean, from the country bear jamboree, the buffalo head on the wall. <laughs> um, I knew him from Sons of the Pioneers. I knew him from the Johnny Man singers. I didn't know. I didn't even think about him as Tony the Tiger. And everybody else was like, "What are you talking about? He's Tony the Tiger." I was like, oh, that's great. So we had him. That is great. And He's a celebrity. We had him and and Timothy Day, the little kid, and uh, all of us. But John. John Lovitz had gotten a chance to be on Saturday Night Live, and it was after we had cast him. And so I was writing furiously, and I just got noticed that, well, John's leaving. He's going to New York because he's got Saturday Night Live to do now. So, th- and, sorry, th- this was all based out in L.A.? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so they're just, you know, he's leaving. Uh, 
So he, I, I called him and said, look, I wrote it for you. Can you stay in town? So I, so we, I did one marathon session. So they had, uh, everything you heard was recorded on one night with John. Wow. <laughs> and my recording engineer said he had, hadn't ever seen that happen before. Um, but then I sat in and, and did my pseudo John Lovett's voice for Deanne and the rest to perform with. So for me, it was really fun as a director to sit in and be, at least temporarily, one of the characters during the scene mm -hmm. as they were doing it. And I remember, and Deanna, this was is something I'll throw it back to you after this. The, um, I just remembered one evening mm -hmm. where we were doing ensemble and we had finished with your part for that day. And you know, you, you left the recording room and I continued to work with the other people. And then I looked through the window and I saw you sitting with a cup of coffee right behind the glass, just looking. Mm -hmm. And it was like a half hour, 45 minutes past your wrap time. So I, I went out and I said, Deanna, you, you're done, you can go home. And she said, well, I kind of feel responsible, you know, for the rest of the group. I, I, I'm kind of turning into the toaster. I think we're all, <laughs> I think we're all turning into our characters. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. But that sounds like me, it's very much so. And I think we, we are our characters, very responsible, trying to save the day. Yep, that's Tim. And Tim was like, Tim is like taking, he's like, he, he he's was, insane. He was taking calls from his manager and stuff. He'd be like, Tim, what? It's like, time to record. Oh, what page are we on? You know? so, <laughs> and then Deanna would show him. So yeah, we no, were very right over much here. a character. Well, gee, I still don't know the page. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tim's great. Did he make up the line, I'm aching with joy? Because I am aching from uh, joy at the end, uh, yes. So I, just let, I just told him, just go. Yeah. Just have fun. So. <laughs> and the kid, Timothy Day, the, the voice of the blanket, when, when he cries at the top of the stairs, people ask me if I like hit him or threaten him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually didn't. He was, uh, he was an amazing performer. I mean, he, he actually would say, I mean, he, he sounded four years old. He probably looked six, but I think he was eight. <laughs> he was a very so sophisticated child that, that you were dealing with. And some people didn't notice it. I, I saw people on the set sometimes, you know, say, well, Timmy, you know, blah, they'd talk to him in that way, and, and he, he was way ahead of them. So <laughs> I was just telling them straight on. And he would ask, like, what's going on? What's my motivation? Where am I? What's happening to me? And it's like, he was the actor that said, what's my motivation? Right. It was that little kid. <laughs> so I said, you cry. And I said, you know, I said, I want you to cry so loud that, the, that through the double glass, the sound engineer hears you without his headphones. I mean, this is like mm -hmm. the next county should hear you cry. And he's like, okay. So we called take, and he just did it in one take. And wow. we started calling him one take Timmy because he would just always say, so, what's going on? So even his thing where he's like, you know, but I don't want another, I want our master, you know, and it, the, the shake in his voice and everything, it's like, he would just explain the moment to him and he would go right there and do it immediately. And it, it was amazing. Had he done anything beforehand, or did you find him? No, and, I, and his mom just came with him, and she was not like a stage parent whatsoever. She, she, he brought her there, and she just provided driving the car and sitting, waiting for him to be done. She said that he had just seen, uh, you know, on TV, had heard a child's voice in a cartoon or something, and said, hey, I could do that. And so he said, Mom, I want to go do some stuff. And, so she made a couple calls, and, and she brought him there, and he was great. Well, I guess uh, if anyone has a question, we can open it up to the audience here. How does it feel to be responsible <laughs> for making the entire generation deathly afraid of climbing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of things in the film that, uh, that are dubious to be responsible for. And if, of course, you all realize that back at your dorms and apartments right now, your inanimate objects are having a field day. <laughs> I think somewhere a Kindle and uh -huh. an iPad have moved past conflict into falling in love. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah, that was, I mean, it, that was the thing where we said, okay, the toaster's dreaming about being reunited with the master, and the happy moment turns to a nightmare, and then. The burning toast means the toasters may be feeling responsible, like maybe I made him leave, maybe I took him away. The smoke 
pulls them away. And then we thought, well, what are toasters afraid of? It's like water. And, so it's like, and fireman clowns. And apparently and fireman, fireman clowns. clowns. <laughs> clowns. The most horrifying <laughs> fireman clowns you can imagine. <laughs> and forks and falling in the bathtub while you're plugged in. And all that kind of stuff. I, that's fine. I, I never noticed that he says run like through yeah. his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think that yes. just terrified great, me even more. What a great segue from the hitting the bathtub and all the sparks to the lightning. Right. See, that's filmmaking. That's Wake nice. up. <laughs> uh, how well of a job do you think Ramirez did on the two sequels? I've never seen the two sequels. <laughs> so I, I, I can't say. I, you know, all of us that worked on the originals, were, we were very at, attached to each other as a unit. We really cared about it. We had an approach. We never saw it as a kid's film or a product. Um, there were, you know, certain forces at work with the finances to say, it's a cheap movie, send it overseas. Um, we just, you know, all, all of us on the team just said, well, no, I, it's like we're going overseas too. We're gonna be there too. And uh, Rebecca Reese, my wife in the back of the theater right now, was a directing animator on the film. And she taught classes to the animators in Taipei and um, helped them come up to a standard, and then all of our group, when we got into production, some of us said we're ex-Disney, and a lot of us went back to Disney, and later times, um, some people were directly out of college, but we had to do every day what we normally would do in two weeks at Disney, so it's kind of intimidating to look at that schedule. Um, but it, anyway, it just kind of bonded us together, so we worked here, we worked overseas, which there's other stories, it's kind of for us in those days, Taiwan was kind of like walking into Blade Runner for, for us. <laughs> um, but James Wong with, at Cuckoo's Nest was amazing, a wonderful guy to work with uh, over there in that studio. And um, we wound up just really caring about it at, that, at the level of making something we would be proud of despite the cost constraints and dedicated to storytelling that we had learned at the feet of some of the Disney, you know, the nine old men before they retired. We, listen to what they had to say and try to apply it to something contemporary. <laughs> and so it meant a lot to us and I didn't see the sequels but I had just heard that there were sequels being mounted. Um, and just the, through the grapevine was it was more of a um, commercial venture and uh, I just was disappointed that that approach was being taken and that none of the original crew were involved. Right. So, had they not even contacted you about that, or it was just a purely... Uh, you know, there w there was no, like, hey, should we make another one at the time? It just started happening, and all of us found out it was with other people, so, uh, you know, I just haven't found it in my heart to watch the other films. But they might be great, I don't know. I was in them and I didn't watch them because I, <laughs> first of all, it was 10 years later and the scripts were not, I mean, they didn't feel like film, they felt like, well, let's just do this, do you know what I mean? Like, because we can. So, it was 10 years later, and when I first went in, I was like, hi, I'm the toaster. <laughs> it was 20 years. And uh, it, it, the, he was fine, Mr. Ramirez, you know, he, he's trying his best to be a good director, it was just not the same. It, you know, it wasn't really character driven, it was more like, let's do the film. They tried to do music again, and you know, they just tried. There's a couple of parts of it, there's one song that I liked, which is Home Again, Home Again, in one of them. And I re that's the other problem, is they kind of, I'm mixed up on them. I don't know if I went to Mars, or I went home, or I rescued, <laughs> I, you know, there was in college. <laughs> It was, they were just a little more confusing. But there's one hilarious part in one of the songs, because my voice did get older, there's such an obvious, some singer dubbed me in, it was so embarrassing. It was some high note and then suddenly, wow, that's not the toaster. <laughs> See, that's the difference. In that film, if I hit a bad note, it would have been part of the character, but in this right. one it was like, no, we have to put a real singer in there. And it's like, yeah, that's not the toaster. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the music, uh, working with David Newman. And oh, amazing songs. What a treat. I mean, he, he got into exactly the same headspace as the rest of the group. It's the, the sort of reality thing. I mean, I know it sounds weird to think about these appliances as real, or what would a toaster really feel? Or what would a 
Mm -hmm. what, like, well, the way the lamp wouldn't feel that way, the toaster would feel that way, you know, but we really got into that space of saying, look, they, they symbolize things we all feel. So uh, David absolutely got into that headspace of believing it, of making it solid, of making it a, a movie score as grand and committed as any score he would ever do. Yeah. Um, and didn't sort of say, well, because it's animated, I will write differently. He just said, mm -hmm. I'm, this is a movie. Right. And when it's about um, the, you know, feeling sad or feeling like you, you're worthless and you're going to be snuffed out or the joy of reunion, the redemption, or, you know, throwing, when you throw yourself mm -hmm. into the gears, I mean, he just, to him it was life and death and joy and love and loss and struggle and he wrote it as expansively as he could. And it was interesting too when we went to mix his music and the rest of the stuff. Um, they, the, the mixers asked, how do you want us to do this? Because it, we've never mixed a cartoon before. And I just said, well, don't mix a cartoon. I said, mix this as your next movie. And they were like, oh. And like within a half hour, they were completely at home. And just did that. So the actors and David with the music and the, you know, the, the sound engineers, everybody just did, this is a committed story. We believe in it. We don't belittle it because it happens to be drawn. Right. And they just went forward with it. And, and David was just amazing. And, he, and his way of composing, too, he, he had talked to me about uh, that to him, joy always has some sadness behind it. It's like, it's either the sadness that the joy is not going to last forever because nothing ever does, or, <laughs> or it's that it's, it's hiding something or that it's come from something sad and now there's joy. So he said, look, every joy has, a tear, every chord of joy has a tear behind it to, to work well. And so he, he had that dimension in his composing that I thought gave it a, a richness. And it took until 2004 for it to be released. Yeah. yeah. Sad. That's unfortunate. It's, yeah. Uh, but at least it's, at least it got a, a limited release and people got to hear it. So. Yes, any other Appliance <laughs> fetish <laughs> questions. <laughs> like for this generation, this is a film that we grew up with. How would you? What what societal impacts have you seen that this film has done to I don't know, our generation? I think it's like we're, we're now seeing this as adults, and this is our childhood film to an extent. Like what? what how has like how, what impact have you seen? Well, I'll, I'll, Deanna has a great story. I'll, I'll just tell you one quickly. I. I you know, I posted some experimental stuff on YouTube and, and, and connected with somebody else, and he works in a bike shop in the Midwest, and, you know, he had no idea who I was, and we were just doing, like, Radiohead videos and comparing them and stuff. And then he, uh, I guess he Googled or did IMDb or something and found out that I had done Toaster, and what he said was, oh, my God, you know, that taught me about what's important in life and do you know it's like fighting for things you love and he just got there were all these sort of deep things he poured out in this no and and it wasn't a LA film person or a fellow person in the business who was trying to you know to uh, make points or whatever it was just a genuine reaction from a regular person a young person and I was so touched by that. And Deanna, tell, tell them what happened to you. Oh, this is a generation story, I think. Um, <laughs> my son deployed to Afghanistan in July, and I went to his um, deployment ceremony. It was in June. And he had told the Bravo company, my mom's brave little toaster. So at the deployment ceremony picnic, I had to sign toasters. <laughs> <laughs> they brought special pens, and they took them with them. So there are now toasters in Afghanistan <laughs> with the soldiers. Right. Because the soldiers fighting, they're your generation. They grew up on the film and they were like, that was a major thing to them. And of course I was honored to do it. And I, I was going to write Toast the Taliban, but I decided that would be rude. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, can, I thought, that's such a cool line because it has a two T's in it. But yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so that, that I thought, wow, that you want to take a toaster over there while you're fighting. I mean, it just is really cool. But that movie, and one of the soldiers, he's a specialist, Marshall Hodge. I should have brought it. He, he, did, he does drawings of the Brave Little Toaster. 
and he has one drawing that I was given, and it's the, what do you call it, the, the magnet? Yeah, the electromagnet. The magnet tows all the appliances, but the Bravo company's protecting the appliances, and they're going up in the oh, magnet. that's awesome. It's awesome. Ah. It's a line drawing. I'll have to get it to you. I'll post it. But I'm, I'm curious what, what you guys feel like you took from it. I, you know, I was hoping that it had messages of valuing things from your past and taking them with you into your future and, uh, you know, instead of just throwing things away. Um, in, in terms of your relationships as well as your things and uh, connections to the past. So, but I'm curious uh, what, what you guys feel like you got from it or have done if it wasn't kind of a little outcast. I mean, it, everything from like, uh, you know, what are you going to do, suck me to death? You know, it's like, I could have done that. That's not Disney. I could have done that at a studio. Not then. And sort of just without drawing attention to it, having an interracial couple with Rob and Chris, that I probably couldn't have done that at any studio at the time. Um, really, even in uh, it was uh, made in eighty seven. Was that right? eighty five? Eighty five. Eighty five. Yeah. Oh wow. But just you know to to consciously make that. Well, that, that's you, you, be, you mean in a, in a cartoon that was? Yeah, was so in an animated well. film. I mean, it it, it, it was. Uh, Absolutely. But it, you know, it was something that just you know I found that not only myself but the the wonderful creative people that were with me on it. We were in the kind of workspace, thanks to Tom Wilhite, who was the main sort of protective umbrella creatively. Um, he just believed in that the film could work, and he believed in the people he had hired to steer it. So we would just get in that playful headspace that usually we'd get in after work at Disney, where right. you know you'd like do your job and you'd, you'd be doing all the, the standard stuff, and then you'd go, "Hey, wouldn't it be fun if?" And you'd do all these joke drawings on the wall and stuff. <laughs> well, we'd do that, and it was in the film. You know, right. we didn't have to say, well, it was a joke, now back to work. It's like, hey, the joke's in. It's like when Vacuum yeah. goes behind that tree to empty himself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that kills well. me every time. It's like, oh. And then the Blanky's going, well, well like, yeah, it's, like, hey. it's not polite to, to look at a vacuum. But there's a, that movie is filled with those moments, just very funny, edgy moments. Well, and, it, and that was another thing, is it seemed like people thought you either had to go sort of Beavis and Butthead like let reality and emotion go and just go to the jokes or be like overly sincere all the time, you know? And it's like, no, it's like, you know, just when we'd hang out with each other, we could really care about each other and love each other and joke. And we thought, well, it's perfectly natural for the characters to totally have contemporary comedic presences and really care about each other and hopefully bring a tear to your eye at the right moment, you know? Mm -hmm. so. So we were allowed to because we were on the fringe. That man had a question. Yes, yes. sir. Well, I'll, I'll soon be 75. And I've never seen this film before. Uh -huh. And one thing that impressed me is that I really grew up in a different world. Right. The notion of someone repairing a toaster. Oh, yeah. It's right. so alien to modern <laughs> society. Yes. Where, you know, so I think you've struck a blow to maybe encourage other generations not to just chuck things and waste things, yes. but to fix things and save things. Well, I, you're, you're right. I think that's, I, I'm so glad that on your first viewing, that was an impression you had. I, I've ab absolutely thought about that. Um, you know, we're, we're in an age now where, I mean, I, I also am passionately into new technology, but I also mourn the fact that when you're done with your smartphone, it's just, or it breaks you, you know, it's just it just goes away it's you can't it's not designed to open up and fix you can't show it care and have that matter but there was this sort of you know that the earlier mechanical devices you could show care and they would respond now you you swear it you <laughs> your smartphone and you, you might as well chuck it um, but it, you know it's it's a right now it's a I'm not sure what the next phase will be, but I'm, I'm sure being able to, you know, you can get in and manipulate code and you can fix things at a software level, but to actually have software married with devices that you can repair, I'm, I'm not sure if we're going to go to that space, but, but it's, a, it's a nice message, it's a nice issue, and I think the metaphor of it standing for 
relationships uh, amongst each other is is the bigger the bigger thing. So. Um, yeah, I just remember watching this. Uh, you know, when I was much younger, and you know, just enjoying it for the basic emotions and stuff. And then watching it again tonight. Yeah. It was such a different experience because I actually caught all the jokes. And, you know, <laughs> you can just go. Whoo, <laughs> right, right. It was like, oh, this, you know, this is really funny, and it's not just like. You know, it's a very, it's a movie for a really wide audience. Right. You know, it was nice to be able to come back and be like, it's as good as I remember, maybe even better. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, because, you know, there's so many movies you see as a kid, you think they're really good. And yeah. Again, they're really not. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> yeah, but this one, you know, it's really different, so I was really excited that, you know, it looked up to Oh, thanks. I'm so glad it, it worked that way for you. I, I know, you know, all of us, in, in my, you know, my generation of filmmakers, as we were heading into Cal Arts, and then out, we we had been listening to the, you know, some of the veterans at Disney and and from other studios as well, Warner's and stuff. But they they all said that they never made films for kids. They said we made films for ourselves as filmmakers, and we thought, well, if we like it when we're making it, then you know somebody likes it. It's like. If we don't like it, but we think somebody else does, maybe nobody does. You know. Right. So they went. If you, so we did that where we said, as as people freshly out of college, we made a film that we liked, that we knew wouldn't be inviting to kids, but it wasn't made for kids. <laughs> um, it, it it would embrace them as well as anyone else. And yeah, I, I think I heard it's, it's probably yeah. the least condescending <coughs> kind of animated film for not for children, but for children in the sense that. You know, it, it doesn't. Not not that animated films are necessarily patronizing or anything, but it, but it, it never but it never e talks to yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's easy though. I've I've dealt with some people who are brilliant writers or directors in the industry in live action, and often they would drop into a condescending place if they tried to come up with something for animation, and um, I you know I would talk to them about it and say well you know. Keep, keep your writer's hat on, keep your director's hat on, the same one you would wear for live action. It's just you're getting the image on a screen a different way. But stop saying, well, I don't need to write a good scene. It's for kids. It's like, right. no, write a good scene. <laughs> you know? Uh, so uh, how, did, how did you guys feel when uh, you saw uh, Toy Story, the, the original, when that came out? Oh, it was great. We saw it as, like, the, you know, the, well, next, the next inanimate object feature right and, I mean because well because yeah. John at Lasseter had and, and Joe Raft had both worked on Ray Little Toaster right on well John had worked John had wanted to work on it and had worked for uh, a number of weeks or something I was not aware of exactly the early stage of could this be a movie and when Will Hyde came to me um, John was already off the movie but Joe and Brian McEntee were were on the film with me and so I, I love John, I went to school with John, but I never saw him once during the whole 18 months that I made the film. So he, I, I know he worked on an earlier potential phase, and I, I know he had it on his radar to make, but um, his path went a different way and, and I wound up doing it. But um, Joe did go and join the Pixar forces, and since, I mean, I, I'm doing a show right now and uh, at Disney, it's a theme park attraction for Disney, and it's my 15th for them now. And John Lasseter now being part of the equation. We were sitting together earlier this year, and it was great to be back together working on one project uh, again. But we hadn't been in that sort of headspace working together since uh, CalArts when we were students at CalArts. Oh, wow. So that was a long time. But yeah, we, it would have been nice to collaborate on Toaster, but the, our, our time on it, Never uh, coincided. It's like he was gone before I came on. Did Did you talk to him after Toy Story had come out, or, or did had he consulted with you at all? <coughs> no, at, you know we were just really busy with other things. He, but I'll tell you, we were um, when I was uh, directing sequences on Tron. There were two of us. Bill Croyer and I were the computer graphics choreographers <laughs> on Tron. That they, they gave us that title for some reason, but we were the two guys that storyboarded all the. Computer, strictly computer sequences. So like the recognizers and the light cycles and that kind of stuff, uh, we boarded in and then took through. And 
while we were working on that, John came in to the trailer and was looking at, oh my God, computer <laughs> images and stuff, and got really devoted to following that part of it through. And, I, and I've loved it, and I've been an advocate for all media as a way to tell stories. And I remember there were some people that were purists that were really not happy that I was involved with Tron or that thought that, well, it'll do, you know, it'll do a recognizer, but it'll never do a character. And, um, you know, I totally believed it would get there. And John absolutely believed when, it, when he came in the room and just looked at the screen the first time and um, that sort of gave him the bug, I think. And I just was a, a ravenous fan <laughs> of, of his work as he got into it. So I just, I just applauded. I didn't collaborate. I just applauded. <laughs> <laughs> could uh, could you ever see doing doing or I guess redoing the Brave Little Toaster in 3D if they if they ever prompted you? You know, uh, <laughs> I I have to sort of plead the fifth about anything <laughs> specific except that I you know I think it would be really fun to go back and let those characters have a a second phase of their. Adventure, but I'd, I'd be curious from you guys, um, what sort of, what sort of things, if that were to happen, you would like or not like about a translation to CGI, in terms of. The <laughs> Don't touch it. Well, what if it were not this film? What if it were a, a picking up the day they that this left the, the next day after this film. <laughs> they step through the door, and I think I think Toy Story Three is actually doing that right yeah. now. As yeah, we speak. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. I I, I, I somehow feel it, it might it might compromise its integrity a little bit. It's it's uh, yeah. It it being in two D, I, I think is is part of part of part of what the story is about. Or, or yeah, it's well. I'll tell you. It just it feels like the characters came alive in that medium and. And they feel so comfortable there to me, um, but I have, you know, on the inanimate object grapevine, I've gotten a couple nudges um, to think about it anyway. So, oh, so had, I'm thinking. Have they now? <clears throat> after after the, uh, the the two sequels, did, did they did they talk about or 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 propose to you after the movie came out about doing like a series for the Disney Channel or or was that not even a discussion? You know, I I. I don't know. I just I just know that um, you know, I sort of was out of the loop once they were into doing sequels without any of our original team on board. But uh, I reconnected with Tom Wilhite uh, later on, and Donald Kushner, and Peter Locke, and Roland Carroll, the, the, the four people, and they, you know, they didn't go into detail, but they said for themselves they had arrived at the conclusion that with the various experiments, the original team and the original movie was the one that had developed a following, and that the sequels hadn't, and so at least what they were taking forward as what they felt like was the, the valuable part of that whole equation was the first film. Mm -hmm. So I know as of today, that's kind of their mindset. Yeah. So. And have they, uh, has Disney talked about putting on a Blu-ray at all, uh, working, working? I don't know, but I, I got to say I apologize to everybody that it was like this scratchy negative and positive dirt transfer and and the wobble at the beginning <laughs> does it well but, but, it, but, but the original film when we screened it on film it didn't wobble so the, uh, that, that although if that's part of your experience and you like it that then that makes me feel a little better because when I look at the wobble I'm like but but we didn't film it that way it doesn't wobble but before the film started tonight, he said, I hate this wobble. In the <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't remember the wobble. Oh, that wobble. <laughs> well, I think what they, well, I think what they did is, you know, Will I, when we took it up to, to several festivals, and we went to the Sundance Film Festival with it as we were seeking uh, distribution in 80, uh, 88 January of 88, I think it was. And um, he, so he had a, a print. He'd made a wet gate, wet gate print that looked nice for, for a number of things. I think that what they did eventually was uh, just use that print that it was pretty worn to transfer for VHS and for, for DVD. But that was an interesting experience at Sundance. <laughs> it got a great response. And then I was pulled aside before the awards ceremony and told by 
several of the judges that they had had their meeting behind closed doors and said, you have the best film here this year, but we can't give it to a cartoon or people will not take our festival seriously. But we just wanted you to know that we really do think you have the best film here. Wow. And I kind That's of said, well, I think, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Jeez. Now, you know, I'm glad now that things have changed and people like animation and <laughs> people think animation. That there was also a time when it was all group of us, including Lasseter and Bird and Musker and everything, that we, we swore there would be a day that animation would, you know, break $100 million. And people thought we were nuts. I mean, that, that was in the days of Fox and the Hound. Right. But we were just going, look, be filmmakers. Like Star Wars was making lines go around the block. I mean, well, it's just a matter of what film you make. So just make a good film. Right. And uh, so anyway, it was, it, it was an interesting time. But the Sundance, as it was starting out, couldn't bear to give the honor to a cartoon. I wish I had gone to Sundance, because I would have told them. Yeah, I needed a toaster there with me. Oh, it's such a treat to, to see Deanna tonight, because I think the last time we saw each other was probably prior to most of your births. So, oh, wow. Really? I think so. Well, yeah, 23 years. Yeah, something like that. You haven't changed a bit. <laughs> any, anything else? Any, any final questions here? Like, why did, a why did you do it question, or <laughs> what did this mean question? Yeah, I noticed that the tone of this movie is a lot darker compared to most other animated features, both at the time and even for a large part since then. Uh, can you go into a little about what motivated that? And you know, how much did you decide, how dark you decided to go? And do you ever have to pull back where you're thinking maybe, okay, maybe this is a little too much? Well, no, that was the nice thing about being the low, tiny budget feature outside of a studio. Is that and 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 with with Tom Wilhite really being there to protect things, um, he just trusted where I was going with the film, and I had people working with me in in storyboarding and 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 layout and the, and the, the the voice team performing where we just believed the world and said, well, what if you were this tiny thing and you were trying to deal with what you didn't know for the first time. It would be overwhelming. It would be scary. It would be huge, and and you know we had limits in terms of budget and the time and schedule that were driving us crazy. But we just said, given that, given those constraints, let's let's just make it as believable and as real as possible. And and I think that the fact that I would invite, like that, I, I filtered out when when voice performers came in and trivialized it. I said no thanks. And then when Deanna and her team came in and put a reality to it, I said, okay, you're on. And then same thing with music, same thing with sound effects. Just at every level, I was trying to give it something more tangible and real that, that would go to that place you're talking about. So like even the sound effects, no, none of it was from a library. All, all of it was foliated from original objects that I found around town. So I was driving people crazy in these antique shops and secondhand stores and stuff because I, I went in with the editorial assistant and we had pencils, and we'd be like tapping everything in the store, <laughs> and like, well, and then people would rush over. What, what do you can man help you? What are you doing? It's like, well, I need something metal that sounds dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so like what? It's like, well, it's an animated film, and there's a lamp that thinks he's bright, but he's kind of dim, and it needs to have a hollow sound that has a little stupid. And, and I and I sent Michael a picture that I, I actually took tonight of. Lampy's head, because it was the last thing I found that, that was the right sound, and it was actually one of our pot lids for cooking, and and Rebecca still uses it to cook with, and I always freak out a little bit when I see Lampy's head on the stove. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you can still pick that lid up and say, you know, go find your own place, you sleepy little fuzzball, and whack it, wow. and it's the the moment. Um, but everything, Lampy's neck and. The, radio and the toasters, springs, everything, I searched all over LA to find the noise and then brought it in and we recorded fully for everything. So there was nothing from a library. So to your point of sort of the reality and the darkness, I think the fact that you didn't have the comfort of going, oh, that's the sound I heard in Huckleberry Hound or that's the sound I heard 
in the last 20 Disney films or that's the Winnie the Pooh archive or whatever. It was just, it was a new character with its own new sound and it was going through scary and joyous stuff. And that it was mixed as a real movie and scored with passion. You know, I, I think all of those things just kind of combined to give it a little more of those guts, which to me is still kind of astounding because the animation style, I mean, I, I had been trained in Disney feature department and, you know, our quality standards were super high. And so on the one hand, I felt really intimidated to go, gosh, every day you have to do what you normally do in two weeks. And, you know, my friends say, you know, it's like Lasseter and Bird and Musker and like all those guys are going to be going, oh, what is this? This is not Disney quality and stuff. <laughs> but, you know, they didn't react that way. When they saw the film, they were, they were very gracious about it because I think they realized we were, we were just trying to do storytelling as good as possible in the schedule and constraints. And to me, the fallback was always just if it felt right at that first moment when you thought it up, to just trust that and go. Let's just commit and go. Yeah, that, that was uh, another thing I wanted to ask was like, what what was your the response from your peers? Now, I mean, did you did you have a screening at, at Disney for for anyone more than than who was involved? Or was no, uh, you know, we really didn't. Uh, you know, Disney wasn't involved with the making of the film. They had bought the rights for the channel release, um, but we did have festival screenings, and so you know, Tim Burton, who I had spent a lot of time with before that and we you know we made Dr. Doom and Luau together just goofing off uh, which by the way Luau has practically everybody of my generation that is in animation anywhere in the world starring in it somewhere <laughs> um, but you know he he came and uh, and some of the veterans you know Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson and a lot of people came and they they all just seemed to be really kind of giddy about the fact that we got to experiment because, you know, we, okay, we didn't have the schedule and the budget, and the quality wasn't possible in that time, but we, we got to have the fun that they couldn't have in the studio walls. So they were laughing at stuff where they're like, oh, we, we can't do that where we are, you know. Was, was this um, recorded at Disney or, or an off? Uh, or no, did you, did it was all, everything was independent. Everything was independent movie. We ran a little, little uh, brick place in uh, Hollywood that was falling apart that we were, I'm not joking, we literally had to grab the bagels away from the rats that got on the table <laughs> trying oh, wow. to grab them before we did. Um, and so, yeah, no, not Disney whatsoever. Um, By the way, I just noticed again tonight that the reel-to-reel -reel woman with the, the reels. Yes. <laughs> you can't do that at Disney, Phil. No, no. <laughs> Yes. You know the one I mean, the tape recorder. Yes. <laughs> it's a little, I don't remember seeing right. that. Well, I tassels. didn't notice it. Yes, that's very funny. It's a tape recorder. <laughs> what? But, you know, in Counterpoint, the darkness, there's that one sequence that's brilliant. That's like Merry Melodies, the, the frogs and the, uh, the, the right, fish right. and the, and the right. sound and the whole thing. It's like they go into another world. It's all a dream right. kind of. It's just so clever. And then you go to the darkness. It's uh, the Well, you know, there were, and there were things, I, I don't know if you guys were aware of it, but there were things, dominoes that I was pushing to try to make you feel things, whether you'd notice them or not. Like, the the blanket being the, that certain kind of yellow. When, uh, you know, at first when they're out on the journey, everybody's like shoving the blanket away and even, even nice mm -hmm. toaster. Tells us to go find another place to snuggle. It, you know, she's not the master. Um, and then later when they get into the meadow, the flower is the same color. Same we color use the same the exactly yellow color. It also sees its reflection. It snuggles too. The blanket explains, I mean, the toaster explains, well, you know, I'm not a flower. It's just a reflection. And backs away, well, the flower wilts. It loses a petal. And the toaster feel sad. It's like, gosh, I made it wilt, you know, feel bad. And that the very next moment, Toaster rescues the blanket, like proactively goes and helps the blanket for the first time, pulling it out of the hole when the little mice are trying to take it underground. There was a little seam cut in there. You, Toaster walked away from the flower yeah. and went to a pond, yeah. looked at a reflection, said something I can't recall, but that seam was cut. That was a dark scene. 
There, you well, do you remember what I'm talking about? I, I, well, we did have in the swamp have you hit the water with where you were feeling down later, but um, well, you didn't need it. But I'm just thinking. But it, just, I actually had to cut about 20 minutes of what would have been in this uh, film out okay. once I actually put a reel together. But, but in any case, that um, so just to follow through that little domino. So she helps the blank for the first time. Then the blanket appreciates being protected by the toaster and makes the tent for them to sleep in. So it was like, you know, the, the flower says, look, you know, you're going to make the blanket wilt too. You know, it's vulnerable, but you could help the blanket. You couldn't this convince the flower. Dark. It's very dark. That's it was not dark. funny. <laughs> it was dark and not funny. But you guys were funny on top of the dark. No, I know. Were, were any of those scenes animated that, that you had discussed? Or, or was, no, was all it was storyboard, and it was uh, Chuck Richardson, who was my production manager, did the reality check with me when I was, I was cutting the reels uh, in, in Taipei. We took the, all the storyboards and scene planning and stuff from here, flew over there, and I was in the editing room putting it together reel by reel. And the, everything was like in Indiana Jones when the big ball rolls <laughs> through the cave. So like... Joe and, and Brian and I had four weeks to do the whole story adaptation. And then I started writing the script a few pages at a time and handing it out to be storyboarded. And I also storyboarded and wrote alternately and was just trying to... Uh, and casting when, and directing. When either, and well, when either I or somebody else would run out of story uh, pages to storyboard, I would go lock the door and write four or five more pages and then hand them out and go back to storyboarding. So. By the time we got over there, then it was like, okay, make a story reel out of this. So I was cutting everything together for the first time just and handing things out to be animated. So sort of, that was still the ball rolling behind my back. And for Chuck came in and said, your film is going to be like an hour and 45 minutes or an hour and 50 minutes. It's like you, you can't do that. I mean, 90 minutes is already longer than most animated films at the time. So I started going, okay, the gopher with the mohawk in the meadow is gone. <laughs> I remember that. Remember the gopher with the mohawk in oh, the meadow? Yeah. <laughs> He's very upset that they're going to sleep gone. on his spot, burrowed up. Oh, that's right. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> but, so stuff was lost, but it was not, not animated good. yet. It was oh, okay. storyboarded, and most of the time voice had been recorded, too. So I'm delighted that all of you are here, and it was just great to have some time to talk with people who grew up with it. I, this is, uh, you know, when we were making it, Rebecca and I were talking about this, that we just, it didn't occur to us, because, you know, we were, like, close to your age when we started working on it, and, you know, you don't think about it being something that is seen by a generation or becomes meaningful to other people. You just make it right then, and it's, if, when your friends see it, you kind of think of it as done. And uh, so this is a real treat. Thank you. Yes, thank you all for coming out.